you can not shout me down. Don't, don't really care. I'm going to preach it the same way either way because I, I believe that there could be something in here that could help you. But if you need a title, it's real simply called This Is Us. This is us. Look at somebody and say, this is us. I don't know if you've ever wondered about what the reputation of Christianity is. Anybody ever think about that? I do. Do you ever wonder what people think you're associated with? Do you ever wonder when it comes to us? And when I say us, by the way, I mean us believers. I believe Jesus spoke directly at it. And I'm going to show you what he said. And then hopefully we can start to look at maybe how we're recognized in our cities what it means to be attached to Jesus and what it means to have this kind of relationship where people see you and they associate you with the living God. It's a giant responsibility. And I think we have had a reputation issue in the past when it comes to our faith, and I thank God that that day is changing. Three people have to clap or I will not move on. I'm from Hillsong Church. We clap at everything. Did you bring a Bible? Quickly go to John chapter... I don't remember exactly. You pick it. We'll make it work. And the, the context here is Jesus trying to set some framework for the community that he wants to see. And this is in the middle of some trying times and stuff. And, and Jesus just drops this unbelievable passage that really struck me uh, a couple years ago. And I, I looked at it forever to make sure that's really what it meant. But I want you to hear what Jesus said when it comes to how you should be known, what you should be known for. And he says this, my dear friends at Passion City, I have only a brief time to be left with you, and then you're going to search and you're going to long for me, but I tell you what I've told the Jewish leaders, you're not going to be able to come where I am. So I give you now a new commandment. Everybody say new. new. Love each other just as much as I have loved you. For when you demonstrate the same love I have for you by loving one another, everybody will know that you're my true followers. Now, we can read that and kind of just kind of move on. But if you're seeing what I'm seeing right now, Jesus is saying, people will know that you are attached to me, not by your car, not by your bank account, not by your followers, not by your popularity, not by your church attendance. If you really want people to go, that person rolls with Jesus, love the people in your row in the church community that you call home, and it will be enough to change the world. This is ridiculous. Says nothing about the world, says nothing about the lost. Jesus is saying there's an inference here that if we live how we are supposed to live, loving people like Jesus has loved us, something will be so ridiculously contagious and explosive about our communities that a world that doesn't want to hear it will not be able to resist it. And they'll walk by like people at a party and go, how do I get in there? We're not even talking about reaching the world. Jesus is saying, look, if y'all want to be associated with me, love each other as I have loved you. I wonder, do people still associate Christianity with love? Just a quick question. If we took a poll tonight at this ridiculous, like giant mall down the road, I've never seen a bigger mall than that one down there, by the way. And we just ask people coming out of there like, hey, um, what do you think of Christians? What's your overriding sentiment with Christianity? Do you associate them with love? I wonder how many people in Atlanta would just walk by and go, oh yes, Christians. They are the most loving people I have ever seen in my life. I'm actually not a Christian, but I can't wait till I bump into a Christian because they give money and they're kind and they're so cool to hang out with. Like love, yes, definitely Christians. How many people have ever heard something like that? I don't think so. I think people know us by our politics and they know us by our views and they know us by our rule book and they know us by our denomination and they know us by our style of music, but I don't think the world knows us by our love. And I am grateful tonight that we have every right in the world to change that narrative. We can't change everything in the world and we can't solve every problem. But guess what we can do, y'all? We can love Jesus more and say, Lord, teach me how to love like you love. And apparently it is enough to change the world. I wonder if we can start to rewrite the narrative a little bit. If you love the person in your row, 
like Jesus has loved you, if this Passion City community continues to grow like it's growing and we do a really good job in here, apparently it's going to make a big difference out there. I've seen this in real time. I've been trying to reach a friend. Anybody have a friend in here that doesn't know Jesus and you want them to know at some point that God loves them? Anybody? If you don't raise your hand right now, I'm judging you on the inside. And I had a friend who was pretty reluctant to come to church. And uh, one night I just took a shot. I'm like, hey, um, you want to come hang out with me and my friends? And I was a little bit apprehensive about it because I have some really awesome friends, but we're loud and we're wild and we do dumb things. But I'm like, man, he's, uh, he lives in a city by himself. Really cool guy. Doesn't have any great friends. I'll just invite him to hang out. And we spent a whole night hanging out. Now, the whole time I was a little bit nervous, Louie, like thinking like, oh my gosh, he's, he's literally going to hate God after this. Like these weird Christian men. Some of us are like 40 to him. That's like and as the night ended, he had to go. I walked him out to his car. I'm like, man, you okay? Are you okay? You have a good time tonight? He goes, to be honest with you, I was just praying that the night wouldn't end. He said, I did not know that there were still relationships like that in the world, especially for Christians. I didn't know. I mean, the way y'all, all we did was live regular life. We had fun. We laughed. We took a moment at dinner to go around and say one thing we love about the people in our world, stuff that should be normal for you too. And evidently, at the end of the night, he goes, well, you know what? I'm kind of interested because I've never seen anything like that. If that is a reflection of what y'all believe, I'm coming. He comes to church the next night, standing next to me. We're singing a song about another in the fire. He's like, man, this song's amazing. What's it about? You know? I'm like, what do you think it's about? He's like, nah, I mean, I just think like when it gets really hot, you know, Jesus is probably with you, right? I'm like, kind of. It's actually based out of an Old Testament story, but don't worry about it. Let's just sing it. Now my friend is a fellow part of our community and there was no worship concert there was no cool podcast there was no hipster preacher there was no gleaming building there was no awesome analytical breakdown of some theological moment that's going to change somebody's life he saw christians being nice to each other is this not ridiculous we got some work to do y'all but i believe we can do it i'm going to break down three things i believe about this love that jesus talked about and I pray that something lands in your spirit that changes you, and then we're done. I got 27 minutes. I'm going to use them all. Because I think that if we can get this right, we can change the world. Number one, this love that Jesus was referring to, this love is defined. It is defined, it is clear, there is no ambiguity about what it means. I live in New York where you have to define every word because everybody uses their own definitions for things. And I love the fact that Jesus goes to this great length to say, a new command I give you. First of all, the old command was hard to do. The new command, they're like, love each other, okay. And then he ups the ante and puts a definition on it. And he goes, I want you to love each other as I have loved you. This would have been frustrating for these guys because when you start thinking about it, they can't define now what they think love is. They have to love people as Jesus has loved them. It now has a definition on it. Why would God do this? Because he knows we should not be responsible for defining words like love. If you were in charge of the definition, you already know who you would love and who you would hate. You don't get my love. You definitely don't get my love. I already know in my mind who I would definitely not give that definition to, but Jesus knew this. So he said, here's what I'm going to do for now until the end of time. If you ever want to know what love looks like, it looks like me. So if you ever get confused about what a loving Christian should do, you don't have to go to your pastor. You don't have to get to the podcast. You need to go back to your Bible and say, does it look like Jesus? Does it talk like Jesus? Does it walk like Jesus? Does it move like Jesus? Does it sound like Jesus? He is love. And when we get this definition stuff right, I mean, I think it's pretty, pretty compelling that we have some work to do. Think about how Jesus has loved you. He loved you when you did not love him. He loves you even though you cannot always repay him. He loves you even when you try to run. He loves you even when you fail him repeatedly, time and time again. He loves you with unmerited grace and favor along with it. His love is reckless. It is ridiculous. It is unearned, but he gave it to you anyway. How you doing with loving the people in your room? Does that not convict anybody or is it just me? Okay, it's just me. You guys are super Christians. Great. One of the things about this love of, of Jesus, what he's talking about here, one of the definitions of this kind of love is faithful. 
Can anybody just take a moment and agree that the love of Jesus has been ridiculously faithful and consistent in your life? Oh, really? None of y'all have ever just... Anybody who has a testimony right now, thank God his love is faithful. Keeps on coming, keeps on coming. But one of the ways you know, just in case you want to do a quick check to see how you're living, or do you really trust this, this definition that God's love is faithful? Um, are you able to give freely? Quickest meter ever, because it's easy to say, yes, God is faithful. Yeah, but if you really believe that, you'll be able to give freely. Give grace, give hope, give encouragement, give forgiveness, give money. Because why wouldn't you do that? If you believe that his love is faithful and it's always going to be poured out on your life, why would you withhold anything? Sometimes I don't think people know the love of God because they don't give. They don't give grace. They don't give hope. They don't give encouragement. They definitely don't give money. And I go, wow, that's interesting because if you love like Jesus loved, you would give even though you know you can't get it back. But when you see people start living like this, oh my gosh, it's a game changer. My daughter, who is now uh, 13, I have another daughter that's 15. Lord help me, prayer meeting for all the dads of teenagers led by me. And when Charlie uh, was younger, we were teaching her how to tithe, how to give, and, and her grandfather gave her $100. And I don't care how bougie you are, $100 is still a lot of money. It's a windfall. And uh, I said, Charlie, you know, you got to tithe on that uh, $100 bill. She's like, yeah, Dad, of course, no, no worries. And I said, okay, make sure you do it on Sunday. I'm getting up to lead a meeting, just like y'all do here, and I feel this little tug on my leg, and it's Charlie. And she's like, Dad, my offering. And I was like, uh, make sure you get it at the right time. This is not the offering time. I'm kidding. I didn't say that. Some of you are like, that's cruel. I took it. I looked at her envelope and I just firstly made sure it wasn't my details on there because Charlie has given on our behalf before and she's been very generous. Um, <laughs> so once I realized it wasn't that, I saw, I'm like, Charlie, the, all, your, all your money's in here. There's a hundred dollars in here. You know, you don't have to give that. And she goes, dad, I know I don't have to, but I just feel like I don't really need it right now. I feel like church needs it. And I figure that if I did need more money, I would just ask you anyway, and you'd give it to me. And I went, you're so right. This is amazing. And as I thought about it, I felt that, na that nasty twinge of the Holy Spirit going, man, that's a sermon for you. Because if we really believe God is faithful, why would we not come into church ready to give worship, ready to give money, ready to give time? Because I know where the source is coming from. I know this is what my God does. But this definition, I wonder what your standard is because you might have your own definition of love. A lot of New Yorkers do love is love, yo. No, it's actually not. Love means let me do me. No, that actually means hate. Love means I'm going to fight for what's right. But if you really wanted to see what the standard is, I'll give it to you. This is kind of tough to, to handle and I didn't do this before, but I know this is the real spiritual crowd. So you can handle upping the ante. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Do you like who you're sitting next to right now, by the way? Who would like to switch seats? We're going to give you 20 seconds to, kidding. This is 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Roughly, it's so sad that this gets relegated to only weddings in our cool, hip, hip Christian culture. It's actually a bigger deal than just something that someone mumbles in a wedding ceremony. It says this, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Love never fails. Now we know we can switch out that word love and we can put in Jesus because Jesus is love. So if you wanna know who Jesus is, that's who he is. If you want to take this up even further, you can use the EIV, the Extreme Introspection Version. And I'll just take it on the chin tonight and just put my own name in here and I'll show you how much work I have to do. Carl is patient. Carl is kind. I'm already failing. He does not envy. He does not post. He is not proud. He does not dishonor others. He is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. I'm not going to go any further. I'm not there. But when you start looking at things like this, it's amazing how you start, okay, this is us. We're supposed to be known by our love. I'm not gonna compare myself to the lowest level of culture love. I'm gonna go straight to the source. And until I see myself in this, I will not relent on saying, Lord, do a work in my life. Come on, somebody, you with me tonight. 
This love is defined. Number two, this love is developed. It's a work in progress. It's not going to happen overnight. Getting this message, hearing it tonight, even agreeing with it is one thing, but actually seeing this thing unfold in your life, this kind of love Jesus was admonishing us to live under, it is developed. It's not something that just we just get and now we're like, cool, we're over the love thing. You know how I know that? If you go back to the text, Jesus just drops a new commandment. This would be a big deal, y'all, to like just sit there and just take it in for a second. A sentence later, Peter goes, yeah, but Jesus, where you be at? Literally goes right back to the other conversation. So Jesus goes, hey, y'all, here's how you're going to live. Love each other as I've loved you. There's no clapping. There's no amen. Peter's like, yeah, back to the subject, Lord. Where are you going? This is evidence that if you and I do not understand that this love is developed, it's not going to be something that happens by default. It happens in the presence of God. And maybe Jesus knew that the only way you can cultivate this kind of love is by being around the author of love. You cannot be a Christian that loves God and not actually hang out with Jesus. You cannot be a Christian that loves people and not actually get time with the creator of the love you are trying to produce in your own life. You need to get with the Savior. But I wonder if you're still developing in this love. I think that if I were to sum it up like this, maybe this will help you. What we never want to do is allow God to change our eternity, but not change our mentality. Eternity, great, I got saved, I'm going to heaven. But here on this earth, nothing continues to develop. Nothing continues to get better. Your mind doesn't change, your language doesn't change. Eternity, I'm going to heaven, big man upstairs. But here on earth, still racist, still bitter, still nasty, still rude. We can't figure out why we're not drawing people into our churches when no one even wants to be around you in your own house. Because we've stopped developing in love. In fact, I mean, remember when people, you know, sometimes first get saved, how on fire they are, how infectious they are. But somehow, rather than develop this way, Christianity has this weird vibe where sometimes the longer people walk with Jesus, the more nasty they get. And they say things like, I'm going to go spend time with God. And they come out even more bitter. And I'm like, I don't know who is in your prayer closet, but it ain't the living God. Because it is impossible to get on your knees and say, Lord, search my heart. Thank you for saving my life. Thank you for giving me grace. Thank you for pulling me out of that miry clay and putting me on some solid ground that I did not deserve. And come out and look at people and withhold. I want to be the type of person that my view of how I'm going to love people, it's getting better. It's getting bigger. People I used to hate, I love them now. People that used to get, be repulsive to me, I actually go after them now. People that I used to write off now because of the love of Jesus, because of what's happening in my church community, it's overflowing into my life outside of there. Man, it's developing something incredible in my life. What about you? Do you love people more today than you ever have? You come into church looking for people who need to be loved because you realize how much love God has poured out in your life. Is this resonating with anybody? You guys are the most intense listeners I have ever seen. Must be the Georgia in you. I'm used to the ADD Manhattan crowd. People are talking, throwing stuff, smoking. It's a mess. Here's a challenging point. Can you write this down? Developing this love, it requires constant maintenance and constant diligence. You're going to have to leave here today and consciously make a decision every day to say, Lord, I've got to get better at loving people today. Have you ever like realized by four o'clock that you're a Christian? <laughs> oh, it happens to me all the time. Like I will go half the day and, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I forgot that I actually have signed up for a different life than I've been living all day. <laughs> Your default. Your default is not to develop into love just by waking up. Your sinful human nature is still active and what you have to do every day is say, Lord, get this right in my life. Here I am, Lord. Today is not just another day. Today is not just another Monday. Today is not just another Tuesday. Today is the day where you're going to use me as an agent of your love. My eyes are open. My heart is full. I am ready for you to do whatever you need to do because trust me, you do not want to get developed out of embarrassment and that's how much God loves you. That will happen. 
I've had one too many of those experiences and I'm not nearly as spiritual as Louie. But as you were telling that story about this girl who gave you a beautiful love offering on the plane, I remember one day I was catching like a 6 a.m. flight. In full disclosure, I don't believe that the Holy Spirit moves until there's double digits on any clock anyway. But it was like a 6 a.m. flight, super tired, headed home to see my family. Hadn't seen them in a while, been doing a lot of stuff, and I was tired. I remember getting to that plane. I was like, I cannot wait to not care about anybody. That was literally my thought. I cannot wait. I'm not talking to anybody. I've got a hoodie on. I've got like triple, like extra large headphones on just to give that universal sign that I'm not talking to you. And I remember I'm sitting there, and through my earphones, I can hear this lady coughing as we're boarding the plane, I'm just looking, I'm like, man, I pity the fool that has to sit next to this human being. I mean, there should be a rule. If you cough more than 10 times while you're boarding, you shouldn't be able to fly. Like I have all this stuff going through my head, haven't prayed, hadn't read my Bible. My default, again, is not gonna go towards the love of God. And I get on the plane and as I see this boarding happening, I see this, I can hear the coughing lady. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I cannot wait to see who gets to sit right next to the coughing lady. It wasn't the type of coughing you could just hear, you could feel it. You know, some people cough, you could feel it get on you. And coughing's getting closer and closer and closer until it lands directly there. She said, hi, that's my seat. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. She sits down and we take off. No, she probably coughed every four seconds. Maybe a big break, maybe a minute, then more coughing. And as we take off, I finally ask, how you doing, ma'am? Can I get you a lozenge or something? You know, because of the coughing. And she looks at me and she goes, I'm so sorry. She's like, I'm headed to um, this place to get some, some further testing. I've got lung cancer. And uh, pulls out her x-rays. And I looked at her and I said, you know what, ma'am? I'm going to go into the laboratory and light myself on fire. And I'm going to come back in just a second. I'm going to talk to you. I remember sitting back down. We talked the entire way, talked about healing, talked about people in my church community that have overcome cancer, talked about people who maybe didn't overcome it in this life, but they got their healing in heaven. We had this amazing conversation, held hands by the end of it, prayed, exchanged numbers, ended up coming to church. And I remember just leaving there going, Lord, I don't want to develop out of embarrassment ever again. Thank you that you love me so much that you will put me on front street at 6 a.m. to remind my broken self that I am not here under anybody's orders but yours. I am not here to exist. I am not here to have me time. There is no time where this love gets to clock off. This is what we do. I have a feeling that if we did less time, you know, if we did less praying for opportunity, and more being aware of the opportunities around us that are already existing. Lord have mercy. I do believe we're going to see things in our churches we have never seen before. What about you? Are you developing in this love? What's on your screensaver? What goes through your mind at night? When you wake up, how often do you think about the people in this church and your community that Jesus commanded you to love? He didn't give you an idea. It's a command. He wasn't talking to the world at large. He said, I want y'all in here, my disciples, Christian on Christian. I want you to love each other as I have loved you. It is defined. It is developed. Thirdly, as we close, I believe this love is dangerous when demonstrated. Look at somebody and say, I feel dangerous. (laughs) Was that weird? By the participation level, it seemed like it might have been. I believe this love is defined. You don't get to choose your version of love. It has to look like Jesus or it's not love. I believe this love is developed. Nobody in here has graduated to peak level love status and you can now move on to something else. This is something we have to pour into every day. Lord, develop my heart, develop my mind, develop my soul. Help me to see like you see, walk like you walk, talk like you talk, love like you love. And thirdly, this love is dangerous when demonstrated. Dangerous. It's not necessarily dangerous talked about. The devil doesn't care about you talking about it. It's not dangerous to sing about. Love is cool. Love is love. But it is dangerous when Christians actually start demonstrating the love of God. We just saw a video about a prison that will never be the same. 
because people in this church, not just talking about it, they actually demonstrated the love of God. Now we've got a prison revival. But there is, there's something about this love that we discount because when we think of love, we think of hearts and valentines. We don't necessarily realize that this love that we're talking about, the love of Jesus, it's explosive. This love caused fights. This is the same love that caused our God to be murdered without cause. This is the same love that was so ridiculous that people either shunned him or ran after him. It left no doubt this love is dangerous when demonstrated. Let me give you another little clue about what I mean by demonstrated. This is in Galatians. And I ripped it out of my Bible because I wanted it to be a part of my life. I'm kidding. It just is a printout. Don't you love it when preachers give you random information that doesn't impact your life at all? <laughs> my beloved friends, if you see a believer who is overtaken with a fault, again, this is in-house. It's in the world. This is me. If you see a believer who's overtaken with a fault, may the one who overflows with the Spirit, that means you have excess good stuff in you, seek to restore him. Win him over with gentle words, which will open up his heart to you and will keep you from exalting yourself over him. Love empowers us to fulfill the law of the anointed one as we carry each other's troubles. This is ridiculous, y'all. Love empowers us. If you think you're too important to stoop down to help another, you're living in deception. Now, there's a reason why this is in the Bible. This is obviously happening. There are obviously people who thought they were too special or too Christian bougie or too whatever to actually help somebody else. So the, so the writer of this scripture is going right at him. He said, you're living in deception. Then he comes down and says, let everybody be devoted to fulfill the work God has given them to do with excellence. And their joy will be in doing what is right and being themselves and not in being affirmed by others. Every believer is responsible for their own conscience. Now, why am I breaking this out for you tonight? Because Christianity typically leans one of two ways with this scripture. Either we're all on the carry the burden side, or we're much like modern day Christianity now, we're all on the every believer, it's their own responsibility for their own conscience. I mean, the Bible clearly says it's not my job to live your life, it's your relationship with God. What they don't understand is the, the text speaks loudly to the fact that if we were doing the first part of Galatians 6, the verse four would be a lot easier. If we were actually carrying each other's burdens, if we were actually getting down on our knees and letting people know that we are together in the middle of trouble and storms, then it makes sense to look at somebody and say, hey, you have a manageable burden on you. You have a calling on your life, handle that. But the inference is that as Christians, we gotta be helping each other out. Can you imagine what our world would do if they saw us living this life right here? Christians who actually care about each other beyond this surfacey level. Like you cry, I cry. Nan's hurting, we're all hurting. You had somebody go to prison, we're all gonna wait until they get out and send them stuff every week. You had somebody graduate, we have somebody graduate. You got somebody hurting, I got somebody hurt. Can you imagine if the world looked at Christians and they're like, what? Y'all really care about each other. But we have resorted to modern day church which is our idea of carrying each other's burdens is seeing people in church being like, hey, how you doing? You doing good? And that person says, yeah, I'm doing great. God is good. We're all good. Everything's good. God is up. We're up. We're headed that way. God. <laughs> church platitudes. So nobody even knows anybody's burdens, to let alone carry them. And then if somebody actually does get a little bit transparent, hey, you doing today? Someone's like, I'm actually not doing great. Oh, cool. Hey, thoughts and prayers coming your way all week. <laughs> and vibes. Thoughts, prayers, and vibes. I'm sending them to you, all right? We've got to get to worship. Thoughts, prayers, and vibes, your way. Thoughts, prayers, and vibes? You know what's better than thoughts, prayers, and vibes? Thoughts, prayers, vibes, and money, and food, and telling somebody, oh, you're in the hospital? Thoughts, prayers, and what room? Because I'm going to come in. And if I can't get in there, I'm going to stand outside and I'm going to wave my phone so you know that your church is with you while you're in there. Where have we gotten to in the modern day church where the early church was built on need? We got American Christians that will leave their church because of need. 
Oh, here comes Pastor Louie again asking for stuff. Oh, my bad. I thought this was a church where you use what you have and you use what you have and we got a need up here, we got a need up here. What? How many needs can we cover in this Passion City community because we're working together? My bad. I thought need was the essence of our faith. But be careful. Because if you hear me tonight and you go, okay, I get this. I got to carry burdens for people because evidently that's the will of God and it helps not just them but it helps me be careful because it is dangerous it's going to be dangerous for your religious paradigm because you're going to see people in a new way that you previously used to judge it's amazing how proximity breeds passion distance creates distortion so if you don't know somebody you can judge them but the closer you get the more you understand it is dangerous to your wallet because sometimes carrying somebody else's burdens mean you pay for them, they can't pay you back. It means you send a car out to deep rural Georgia and they get picked up and they come to church and the person never even mentions it to you. It's gonna cost you money. Might even cost you your reputation because when you carry other people's burdens, other people who've never done it will judge the way you're doing it because it's easier to judge you doing it than it is to look in the mirror and realize you're not. So suddenly, all of a sudden, carrying these burdens, wow, it became dangerous. But guess what, y'all? I didn't sign up for a safe, clean, corporately acceptable Christianity. God didn't save me for that. He didn't build this church for that, for us to just say, look how clean our lives are. This white t-shirt sometimes is the goal of Christianity. How clean can I get? Yeah, we're supposed to be clean in our spirit, living holy, righteous, yes. But if we're really doing that, we're going to look a lot like our Savior did, who was laying in dirt with lepers, hanging out at the smoke pit. Some of y'all get that later. Hanging out with people nobody else would hang out. It's amazing how we can be clean in our spirit, but if we're really doing this right, if you really carry other people's burdens, you're going to have some tears on you, and you're going to have some extra things to pray about. And you're going to have some more stuff you know, on your mind, but I'm telling you right now, it changes people from the inside out. Let me just show you how real this is. This is like if you have somebody that you know in your church and you go, wow, hey, it's my friend. You're, you're, what's that? You're dealing with depression? You're dealing with anxiety? Guess what? I don't struggle with that, but I'm going to stand with you as long as you do, just so you know that you are not alone. You never have to fight another day and feel like nobody's with you. I'm with you. It's my strength to be encouraged. And right now you need it. So if you get weak, you call me. If you get lonely, you let me know. In church, if you don't want to sit by yourself because you don't want people to know, but you don't know who to sit with, you sit with me. And on lunch, I'm paying. I'm going to get you through this valley. We're in it together. And then they go about your way and you go back into your world on Monday. And people are like, whoa, you're getting all passion cityed out, aren't you? getting all weird. You look different. In your mind, you're like, I don't feel any different. Like, I'm just living my life. And people are like, something's different about you. And you go back into your church and you start carrying more people's burdens. You have a friend who comes out and you say, wow, I didn't realize it, that your family's going through struggle. Your family's going through pain. I've never known what that's like because both my parents are here. But evidently, you're dealing with some grief. So guess what? I'm going to cry as long as you do. And I'm going to stand with you as long as you need me to. I'm not going to act like it's not happening. When I see you, I will remember it. I'm going to remember the anniversary of when you lost somebody. Even though I haven't, I'm with you. If you cry, I cry. You're not alone in this. And then you go about your life. And people can't figure out why you seem fresher, but you seem really different. You know why? You're doing the work of the Lord. This is what the gospel looks like. The outside view, you look like you're getting worse, but on the inside, you're like, wow. Then you have somebody else in your church. You say, wow, hey, it's my friend. I love you. Here's the deal. Our skin tone is different, but from what you've told me, you don't feel safe on these streets. You don't feel respected. I can never know what that's like, but we are family. So as long as you don't feel safe, I don't feel safe. If you don't feel honored, I don't feel honored. So I'm gonna stand with you and I will protest with you and I will pray with you and I will fight with you because you are not alone in this fight. And all of a sudden you've got You've got needs and you've got stuff all over you. And you might be thinking, yeah, but now what do you do? He's the best part of this whole thing. Somebody once said to me, that car just seems too heavy if we carry everybody's burdens. What does God expect? He expects us to carry them to the cross. 
So if my theology is right, Jesus is saying, carry each other's burdens, knowing we cannot do this on our own. But if we do this correctly, we get to spend a lot of time meeting with the King of Kings because we're carrying burdens. So maybe the best food is on the front lines. Maybe it does mean that the more fight we are in, the more of God's presence we get to receive. Maybe if your spirituality is dry, I'm not going to tell you to go to a conference. I'm going to tell you to go down the road. Find a need to fight for. Find somebody in this church that needs you to lift their weary head and you will never be that Christian who needs to be inspired because you're doing the work of the Lord. This is us. This is how we live. And I promise you this. We're going to win this, this culture war. We are going to win it. The Bible's already told us that. I don't buy the, the narrative right now that the church is losing. We're going to win. But it's not going to be our slick churches. It's not going to be just our rich Christians. It's going to be this revelation that we go, you know what? Let me never forget, Lord, that you have been carrying me all over you. Heaven forbid I'm the, I'm the guy who forgets that. Help me to wear it well. This is us.